Welcome back. We are uh, here at home because we are caught at home because of the coronavirus. But fear not, we do have a lot of interesting things to discuss, to talk about, to share. And uh, I have been going through boxes of stuff which I have not seen for many, many years. And I'm going to share some of those things with you, uh, some of the things I've found, and hopefully will at least enlighten you and catch your interest. The first thing we'll begin with, and this is really, really fascinating. So I've been collecting Svarim books for many, many years, probably about 25 years. And one of the interesting things that I do is that when I get a book and I feel that the binding isn't really good, I rebind it. Now, in, at the beginning of the uh, printing, the publication business, paper was very precious. So today we don't concern ourselves about paper because if you waste a piece of paper, you just throw it away and you start using another one. But in those days, paper was very precious. So if you no longer were using a book because the binding was falling apart, you didn't want to waste the paper, you wanted to use the paper. Somehow at least the paper should be recycled in order for it not to get wasted. The thing is, when it comes to Svarim, you're not just allowed to use a safer a holy book for something else. You can't just use the paper uh, for some mundane purpose. You have to use it for something which is of equal status to the book that is no longer usable. So what they would do is the, the old printers in, in the times, the 1500s, the 1600s, the 1700s, they would take an old safer and they would take the pages apart and they would use those pages in the bindings of new Sforim that they would print, or if they were rebinding a book that needed rebinding, they would take paper from a book, from a safer that uh, was no longer being used and could no longer be used, and they would put it into the binding of a safer. Okay, that's the background. Very often, those Sforim themselves would no longer be usable. What happened to those Sforim? They'd go into Seamus. But if you are a Svarim collector like me, what will happen is, on occasion, you will discover a great treasure. And what I've got in my hand here is one of those great treasures. So I bought a Safer probably about 20 years ago, and it was in very, very poor condition. I had it completely rebound. But in order to have it rebound, I told the binder, who wasn't a Jew, was a Gentile, I said to him, whatever you find in the binding, when you take the binding apart, please make sure to give it to me and to show it to me because I want to be able to see if there is something there that's worth preserving, that's worth keeping. Anyway, he found in the binding of this particular book that he rebound for me, it was a book from the 1700s, a piece of paper which was a printed Hebrew um, a leaf from a book. He, of course, he had no idea what it was and he showed it to me. Here we have it. I'm going to show it to you. It is, you know, I'm often asked, do you collect incunabla? Do you know what incunabla are? Incunabla are books which were published in the very first few decades of publication. The first book ever to be published, ever, Jewish book, was in 1470. Here I'm holding in front of me a leaf, only one leaf, it's the only one I have, of an, in an incunabla, which was published in 1490. So this page here that I'm holding in my hand is 530 years old. It is a, um, it's a piece of the Rambam. So the Rambam, is an extremely important Jewish work. I'm not just telling you this because I studied in Yeshiva and I studied the Rambam and the Mishnah Torah. And uh, for those of us who, who are of a more philosophical bent, the Meir Nevuchim, Rambam Pera Shemishnais, we're going to get to that in a minute. The Rambam Mishnah Torah is an extremely important book. And the reason for that is that in his introduction to the Mishnah Torah, he said, listen, people have a limit as to how many books they can buy and to, uh, what they can do with those books. He says, the fact is that if you are going to buy yourself a Gemara, 
and you're not a great expert as to how to decide Jewish law, you're going to be extremely confused. So what's the point of having a Gomorrah? You have a limit to how many books you can have in your house because they're extremely expensive. I'm assuming, I don't have to assume, in his day, a book was handwritten. Either it was in a scroll or if it was a, if it was a bound book, it was handwritten. If you're going to choose two sets of books to buy, the Rambam said, buy a Tanakh and the Mishnah Torah. No need to buy a Gomorrah, buy a Mishnah Torah. Why? Because I have condensed, I have distilled every aspect of the Gomorrah. I have distilled it into my work called the Mishnah Torah. So the Mishnah Torah took on incredible importance in the Jewish world. So I want to tell you this, that the very first Gomorrah that was published, that means the first Shas ever published was in 1489. The very first Rambam to be published was published many years before, in 1474. Fifteen years before the first Gemara, Sonsino in Venice published the first Rambam. This that I've got in front of me is the second edition, a leaf from the second edition of the Rambam, which was published in 1490 by Sonsino in Venice. And you should know something else, that only two years later, in 1492, the first Mishnais was published. Mishnah, Shisha Sidre Mishnah, the first set of Shisha Sidre Mishnah ever to be published by a printer, was published in the year 1492. Guess what? The parish on that Mishnah was the parish of the Rambam. That's how central, how important he was to Jewish literature, to the Jewish scholarship. Okay, what I have in front of me here is interesting for the following reason. First of all, it comes from Sefer Mishpatim. You know the Mishnah Torah was separated into 14 volumes. That's why it's known as the Yad HaChazoka. Yad, what's the Rashi, what's the Rashi Tevis? What's the uh, Gematria of Yad? Yud Dalad. Yud Dalad is 14. Yad HaChazoka. He divided, the Rambam divided the entire Rambam, the entire Halacha, that exist for Jewish life into 14 separate volumes. This one comes from Sefer Mishpatim. It's, this one leaf contains chapters 12, 13 and 14 of Hilchus Malva Beloive, of those who are borrowers, those who are lenders, um, all the halachas pertaining to those particular situations. I'll tell you what's so interesting about this leaf. Because you're thinking to yourself, okay, so you rescued a leaf from the binding of a book. Very, very nice. Who cares? So the first two editions of the Rambam are different to the editions that we have now in one very important way. So you know that Rabbi Avram from Posquez um, wrote a, um, an annotation, a series of uh, notes on the Rambam that we call Hasogus Haraivad. What's that Sogos arrived? He wasn't entirely happy with the way that the Rambam presented all the different aspects of Jewish law as definitive. He said that not everything is definitive. Some things that the Rambam said are not entirely correct, and he challenged them. And of course, when we study the Rambam today, we take the Sogos arrived very seriously. But for the first two editions printed, published editions of the Rambam, the Sogos arrived were not there on the page. Only for the third edition, which was published some years later, did the printer, the publisher, include the Sogos Arrived, the annotations, the protestations, the notes of the Arrived in the text, incorporated into the text of the Rambam itself, as we are so familiar with if we study the Rambam. Okay, so I have here this particular leaf from Hilchus Malve Veloive in the Rambam from Mishpatim and Yada Chazoka. But don't think that the, um, that the Hasogos Arrived are missing, because whoever bought it was very keen to make sure that the Hasogos Arrived would be included, that he could study this text of the Rambam together with the Hasogos Arrived. So what you have here 
handwritten from the late 15th century are the notes of the Raivud as recorded by whoever it was who used this Rambam so that he could study the Rambam together with the notes of the Raivud and he could make sure that he knew what the Raivud said. So I have printed off, I have actually got it here inside my edition or my page, I say edition, I don't have the whole Rambam here, but in my uh, one leaf here of the Incunabla from 1490, I've printed off the notes of the Raivud and I've compared them word for word with the um, handwritten version that's written here, by the way written in what we call Rashik Sav. You know what Rashik Sav is? Rashik Sav is the is the font that is used, the font that is used in the Gemara that we use to give us what Rashi says. It's known as Rashi Ksav. And the assumption is that that's the way that Rashi wrote out his parish on the Gemara. Toysfus, by the way, is also written in the same Rashi Ksav. Why isn't that called Toysfus Ksav? Because it has nothing to do with Rashi and it has nothing to do with Toysfus. The printer or the publisher at that stage wanted to create a differentiation between the main text of the Gemara and the Perushim, the Noise Kalim, the super commentaries that were on the side of the page. So he used a different font in order to um, show you that what was written on the side was not the main text of the page. So he printed Rashi and Toysfus on the side of the page using this different font. What font could he use? Because the main font that we are familiar with is what we call Ksavashuris. It's the Ksav that we know, the font that we know, the version that we use in the Sefer Torah. And the version that we use when we read a Siddur, when we have a vowelized Hebrew text. So he didn't want to use that. There was only two other versions of Hebrew uh, font that were in use at that time. One of them is the Ksav that we're very used to, very um, uh, um, familiar with, and that is the cursive script that we use to write Hebrew. So Hebrew is not written in Ksav Ashuris, unless you, of course, you are a scribe, a sofa who writes a Sefer Torah or Tfilin or Mezuzah. And for a general person, we don't use the Ksav Rashi to write uh, the script, although in a minute you're going to hear that we're going to, uh, I'm going to tell you who does use it. The version of Hebrew writing that we use is something called cursive script. That is the general um, um, alphabet that is used in the, to convey in writing whatever it is you want to say in Hebrew. When you print it, you generally print it either in Ksav or some version of it, or you print it in Ksavrashi. What is Ksavrashi? In Sephardic countries, Spain, North Africa, Iraq, Iran, they would use something called Ksavrashi. That means they would write in the same way that we are used to the printed version of Rashi on our Gemara. It's got nothing whatsoever to do with Rashi. Rashi never wrote using Ksavrashi. Rashi wrote either using Ksavashuris or he wrote using the cursive script, the script version of the Hebrew alphabet that we're familiar with in writing. Ksav Rashi is something that was invented in that, using that terminology by the printer, by the publisher who wanted to, to differentiate between the main text of the Gemara and the Perushim, the Noise Kalim that were on the side of the Gemara. In any event, the notes that I have here on the side of the, of the text of the Rambam, of the 12, 13, and 14 chap 14th chapters of Loiva or Malve, are, uh, is in Rashi script. I'm going to compare these two versions. So, very often, the, um, the Raivud, when he began, would say, Omar Avram, Aleph, Aleph, Omar Avram. And here we have it, Aleph, Aleph. And it says here, Al Shitosoi. So here in the version that we have, it says, Hu Hoylech. But in the version that I have here in the written version, it doesn't say Hu Hoylech, it just says Hoylech. 
Ve'ein onu niskomim imoi. We don't agree with him. So that's exactly the same. Lefisha loi ba, because whatever it is, eini yodea shal zeh, abori shal zeh. And it's almost word for word. The bori here has an aleph in it. So if you look at the, and, and hopefully when we are finished with the editing of this, of this segment, you'll see on your screen that the word bori in my version here, that is in handwriting from the 1490s, is base reish yud aleph. But the bori that we have in the, orig- in the printed version that we're used to is base reish yud. Similarly, over the page, we have um, a long note from the Raivad, also with slight variances, slight variations. Om Avram, harav zal kosav zeh b'tshuva, v'oisa sheila shetan haloive. So we have here, in our version, we have in parentheses the words sheyesh bishtar. But we don't have that in the version. So it seems that that was added later, maybe from another ksavyad of the Raivad. But in the version here of the person who ever owned this Rambam, this leaf of Rambam that was found in the binding of another book, he didn't have those words, Sheyesh Bishtar, and therefore he left it out because he didn't know it existed, and he continued with the other words that continue with this note of the Rivad. Anyway, a fascinating piece of history here, a piece of a Rambam published in 1490, found in the binding of a book. Okay, let's continue. I love this piece. I love it because when you speak to somebody who learnt in yeshivas, he may have heard of this author, but he won't know much about him. In fact, these are not, it's not a sefer that's widely studied anymore, which is such a tremendous shame. This is the second volume of a sefer called Marcheshes. The Marcheshes was written by one of the greatest rabbis, one of the greatest of all the rabbonim and educators and poiskim of the pre-war era in Lithuania, a man called Reb Chanoich Henech Egus. So Reb Chanoich Henech Egus published the Marcheshes, the first volume in 1931, and the second volume he published in 1935, and that's the volume I have here. I like this particular sefer because I didn't pay one penny for it. I found it in Seamus. So you know that um, I have this uh, habit of whenever I pass a Seamus box, I like to look inside it and see if I can find something which somebody else has discarded, but I think is of great value. I found this, the second volume of Marcheshes in a Seamus box. I have here a photo, an image of the Marcheshes. Here it is. Um, I have another one here. This is a picture of the Marcheshes, Reb Chanachenech Egus, together with Reb Baruch Ber, who is the Rosh Hashiva of Kamenetz, on vacation somewhere in Lithuania during the 1930s. I want to tell you a little bit about Marcheshes because he's such an interesting man, and you're probably wondering, why don't I know more about him? I mean, everybody's heard of the Chavitz Chaim, you've heard of the Arach HaShulchan, you've heard of the Dvar Avram, You've heard of Reb Chaim Ozygrzynski. You've heard of Reb Chonon Wasserman. You've heard of all the great gedolim of the first part of the 20th century who lived in Lithuania. How come you don't really know much about the Marcheshes? So Marcheshe is a very interesting man. He was born in 1863. So he was a contemporary of Reb Chaim Ozygrzynski. By the way, Reb Chaim Ozygrzynski and him were very, very close friends. They spoke almost daily for most of the last years of their life. And that's because in 1898, at the age of um, 35, the Marcheshes, Reb Chanachenech Egus, became a Rav in Vilna of a Kehila. And he also ran a small Besmedrash of Talmidim. And he began teaching. Now, of course, Reb Chaim Ozygrzynski was also a Rav in Vilna. He was, of course, the senior Rav in Vilna. They knew each other from Volozhin. 
because Reb Chana Chenech Egis and Reb Chaim Oizer were together in the Lozhin Yeshiva in the 1880s, during the time of the Nitziv. Now, at that particular period, if you've heard my lecture on the Lozhin, and it's also uh, may not be yet on YouTube, it will be on YouTube, you'll be able to see that the Nitziv and Reb Chaim Soloveitchik, who were the two principal educators in the Lozhin Yeshiva at that time, had a profound influence on their Talmidim. The Talmidim at that time included um, Reb Chaim Oizer, included uh, the Marcheshes, included Reb Issa Zalman Meltzer, Reb Moshe Marotcha Epstein, it included Reb Avram Yitzhak HaKoyen Cook, and many, many others. The Marcheshes and Reb Chaim Oizer were very, very dear friends, and in fact they cooperated on a very regular basis in running the Rabbonis in Vilna. How come you've never heard of the Marcheshes? I'm going to tell you. There's two reasons for it. Because the man was a gone oilam. His svarim are full of the purest and most fantastic Torah that you can find. And yet, if you go into your oitzah svarim in the yeshiva, you're not going to find a Marcheshes. And if you do, it's not going to be well used. And the reason for that is twofold. There's two reasons. The first is, in 1917, the British government declared its interest in creating a, Brit a Jewish national homeland for the Jews in the British Mandate of Palestine once the First World War was over. That British Mandate was established in 1920 and after what was known as the Balfour Declaration, a letter that was send sent by Lord Arthur Balfour, who was a member of the Foreign Secretary, he was, that's the British equivalent of the Secretary of State, he was the Foreign Secretary of the British government, sent a letter to Lord Rothschild to express the British government's willingness to create a Jewish national homeland for the Jews. Many from Rabonim and many from leaders in Eastern Europe said, even though we've never supported the Zionist movement, we now see how important it is because imminently there is going to be a Jewish state and we must get behind it. Now, it didn't happen for another 31 years. That means in 1948, the Jewish State of Israel was created. But between 1917 and 1948, there was something known as the Mizrahi movement. It had already been created in 1902, but it took, over, it took off after 1917. And one of the first signatories to its renewed um, leadership and importance after 1917 was none other than Reb Chanoi Chanach Egis. Now, at the very same time, the Aguda movement was being created. In 1919, the Katowice Conference created the uh, Aguda organization, Aguda Yisrael. 1923 was the first Knesset Gedolia. I've written about the Chofetz Chaim's visit to Vienna, the very famous piece of um, movie footage that was found a few years ago. I wrote an article about it. You can find it on my website. Reb Chana Chenech Egus never signed up to Agudas Yisrael. So that's one reason you've never heard of him, because the PR of the Aguda after the Second World War was certainly not going to include a, uh, a rabbi who was not signed up to their, to their movement. And despite the fact that he was one of the greatest rabbis of the Litvisha world, and of the Litvish yeshiva world, nevertheless, he didn't fit in with the, uh, with the profile that is required of such a rabbi, and therefore, you've never heard of him. Now, the fact is, in 1929, Rebbe Chanach Egus fell out with the Mizrahi. Why? Because in those days, the Russian government insisted that the rabbi of any city, of any major Jewish community, had to have a government-approved education, a university education, you used to have a Rav Mitam, a government-appointed rabbi. And different people would put themselves up for election. And whoever it was who put themselves up for election, that was, who was backed by the Mizrahi, was not supported by Rav Chana Chenech Egus. And he got very angry with the leadership of the Mizrahi, and he refused to support their candidate. And as a result, he fell out with the Mizrahi, although he never came out in support of, of whoever it was that was the Aguda candidate, and he never was political again. Again, 
You never heard of him because he wasn't part of Agudas Yisrael, he was part of Mizrahi. Now, that's reason number one. There's a second reason. In the introduction to the first volume of Marcheshes, he writes that there's a newfangled, new idea as to how one should learn Gemara called the Briska Derech. He didn't support it. He wasn't, a, uh, he wasn't a fan. And he decided that he was going to write his Sefer in such a way that it had nothing whatsoever to do with this new version of learning Gemara through finding sources uh, in the Rambam for the way to understand Pshat in a Sugya. He didn't agree with it. And he presented his Sefer completely outside of the Briska Derech. Well, that's not fashionable, is it? Because if you learn in yeshiva, you've got to be able to learn something through with the briska derech. So he was neither the pilpul derech, nor the briska derech. He was the ordinary way of learning Gemara, and that wasn't a system which endured after the Second World War. And so the Marcheshes, Rabbi Chana Chenech Egus, one of the greatest rabbis and Jewish educators, one of the greatest Talmidei Chachomim of pre-war Lithuania, is almost entirely forgotten. Not by me. Because when I saw his Sefer in the Seamus box, I was so excited. I picked it up and here I have it. I've printed off the pictures of him and I've included a biography of his and I've learned through, I've been through this Sefer, although I haven't been through it for many, many years. So glad to have found it. I'm going to go through it again. Sadly, in the uh, early fall of 1941, Rabchanach Henech Egus fell into the hands of the Nazis, and he was killed. We don't know where he's buried, and we don't know even the day that he died. Some people say he died at the beginning of September, others say he died six weeks before. The truth is we have no idea when he died. We can't even commemorate his yard site. But at the very least, if you ever have an opportunity to learn a Shtukul Torah from the Marcheshes, perhaps it should be an Aliyah for his neshama. We can't visit his grave. He has no descendants. He has no people to remember him. But we can remember him. And that's why I thought it would be wonderful for me to talk about him today. Let's have a look at the next piece. Oh, so I found this. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to talk about one more piece. I went to... Um, University College, London, which, and I studied Jewish history there in the um, mid to late 1990s. I started in 1992, I finished in 1996. One of the professors at University College, London, was a man called Professor Shimon Abramsky. Who's Professor Shimon Abramsky? I made my inquiries. Turns out he's a son of Rabbi Cheskel Abramsky. Cheskel Abramsky, he was the Rosh Bezdin of London. This man, Shimon Abramsky, was a complete non frum Jew. He, he, he was a Mechal Shabbos, Mechal Yom Kippur. H how is he professor at UCL? So you know that in 1929 or 30, whenever it was, Dina Abramsky, Cheskel Abramsky, was arrested by the Soviet authorities for refusing to stop to teach Torah, like Rabbi Akiva. They sent him to Siberia. He had four sons. Only one of his sons remained from. The other three all went, what we call today, OTD, off the derech, and all of them in their own fields. One son moved to Bait Vagan. He's got children, grandchildren, Baruch Hashem, that they are completely on the derech and they are, they are mamshich in his derech. However, he had a son called Shimon Abramsky. Shimon Abramsky was an avowed communist. He moved to London and he married a girl also from a Frum family who was also a communist. And they were completely not Frum. In any event, Shimon Abramsky, who was my professor at UCL, was an extraordinary man because he was a Yodea Sefer. I don't know if he was a London, I don't think he was a London, but he certainly was very familiar with everything to do with Torah learning. He was a great expert in Jewish books and he used to advise Sotheby's and Christie's when they used to run auctions. And 
I used to talk to him about his father. I once interviewed him. I have the recording somewhere. Uh, and he discussed his father and how, when his father came to London, he was already living in London and his relationship with his father after um, his father was Rosh Bez in London. In 1951, his father moved to Yisrael and he became head of the Vadi Yeshivas together with Reb Zalman Tzarotskin. And he was also the Rosh Yeshiva in Slabodka. He used to give a Sheikh Kloli once a week. He lived in Bayit Vagan. He was an extraordinary man. I'm going to come back to Rabbi Cheskel Abramski. I want to tell you a story. So, Shimon Abramski died. I can't tell you exactly when it was, probably about 15 years ago. And I got a phone call from a friend of mine. He says, your professor died. Really? Shimon Abramski, he died. When's Leviah? In three days. Okay. So, I said, I'm going to go to the Leviah. The Leviah was very close to my house in Hoop Lane Cemetery. Hoop Lane Cemetery is in Golders Green in London, and it's principally a cemetery for the Sephardi community, the very old Sephardi community of London, the Spanish and Portuguese community. But part of the cemetery was bought by the Reform. Shimon Abramski is buried in the Reform section of that cemetery. I come to the Leviah. And we went in, we were shown into the chapel. But before I tell you the scene I saw in the chapel, let me tell you a little bit about his father. His father died in El 1976. Tov Shien Lamed Vov. There were 40,000 people at his Leviah. He was considered one of the great Gedolim of the post-war era. Becheskel Abramski died, he was 90 years old. The main maspid at the Levaya was Rabbi Loza Menachem Shach, Rav Shach. It was one of the most moving Elul experiences, I know somebody who was there, of the entire 1970s, 1980s yeshiva experience. The Levaya of Rabbi Cheskel Abramski, 40,000 people. I went to Shimon Abramsky's Levaya. There were a hundred people there. A hundred people. Maybe 50 of them were Jewish. I'm saying maybe because I want to be generous. They came to the Levaya. It was run by a Reform Rebetzin. She was wearing a talus. I'm not sure, I never heard of somebody having to wear a talus by a Levaya, okay. She said her eulogy, her husband, I'm standing there together with my friend. And then they called up the family to say a husband. So one of the grandchildren came up and he said a husband. So he said, I want to say that everybody remembers the great Shimon Abramsky, one of the great Jewish studies professors of the post-war era. But to me, he was just grandpa. What I remember about him is he had dandruff on his shoulders whenever he walked. And he starts giving a hesped, saying the most terrible things about his grandfather. And we're sitting there and listening. Then they say, okay, now we're going to do the burial. This is the son of Rabbi Cheskel Abramski. Take him out. They bring him to the Kavura. So I said, can I help to put, uh, can I help to put the arm inside the ground? No, 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 we have people here, professionals, they're the ones who do it, okay. They put the arm into the ground. So I said, are we going to do the kavura? No, no, we have to go back because we invited a string quartet to play Shimon's favorite music. What are you talking about? You have to do the kavura. No. So the reform, Rebetzin, was a bit embarrassed. She said, well, if you want to do it, you can do it. So me and my friend, we took the shovels and we buried Shimon Abramski. Shimon ben Yecheskel Abramski. With every shovel full of earth that we put into the ground, I kept on saying, this is for Rabbeinu Rabbi Yecheskel. This is for Rabbeinu Rabbi Yecheskel. You know something, from Godel Hador 
to Goy Gomor three generations. That's it. His son, Shimon Abramsky's son, couldn't even say Kaddish. He couldn't read the words of Kaddish. And they needed to ask somebody else to say Kaddish, a friend of his, to say the Kaddish because he couldn't say the words. You know, we have this sense that we are enduring and that we're always going to survive and everything's going to be okay. How do we know? How are we so sure that our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren are going to be all that we want them to be and what we are for our fathers, grandfathers and great-grandfathers? I have here a picture of Shimon Abramsky. And this picture, if you see, he is looking towards the camera, but just behind him is a picture of his father, Bichaskel Abramsky. This pamphlet, War, Revolution and the Jewish Dilemma, is a fascinating pamphlet. It comes, first of all, it's inscribed. It comes from the library of Chief Rabbi Lord Jakobowicz, Emanuel Jakobowicz, who was the Chief Rabbi of, um, of the United Kingdom, of the British Commonwealth. It's a fascinating essay, War, Revolution and the Jewish Dilemma. I just want to read you the first piece. In undertaking to deliver this inaugural lecture, I'm extremely conscious of the debt I owe to my former colleague and friend, continues giving thanks. He's profoundly grateful to this one and that one. And he quotes Isaiah Berlin. A Russian radical of the last century once observed that his country, compared to the West, had a great deal of geography, but little history. It might be said that with Jews, the opposite pertains. More than enough history, too little geography. And with that, I'll end today. Thank you. Mm -hmm.